Good day, everybody. <coughs> next week, next Thursday, we'll have Cheryl McDonald from Vertigo talk about why technical solutions are not enough. Her talk is, has a controversial title. If I remember it correctly, it says, Designs for Nerds. I'm kind of tired of having our profession being referred to as nerds, pejoratively. Just think, if, if you were a great violinist, if you played great tennis when you were six years old, you were not called a nerd. You were called a genius. So from now on, I suggest don't use the word nerd. Consider yourselves being geniuses. Anyway, next, uh, that's next Thursday. Today I have a distinct pleasure of introducing one of our own, Jose Pagan, who was not too long ago sitting where you're sitting. And he graduated from Sonoma State, and he's going to tell us how he survived in the real world. So let's welcome him. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so as he said, I wasn't long ago far from where you guys are sitting. And um, I was always wondering what I was going to do as a CS guy. Uh, all these opportunities, all these jobs, and either embedded systems or web or, or whatever. And uh, so I applied around, and, and I found Enphase Energy. And who here has heard of Enphase Energy? OK, a few. A few. <laughs> So we're a microinverter company based in Petaluma, and uh, that's our headquarters right there. Um, half of this building is, is dedicated to testing embedded systems, this embedded system particularly. Um, this one and, and microinverters. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but um, what, what we do here is, is we create the software for, for this embedded system, and we, we test it heavily. Um, and it, was, it wasn't something that I was aiming to do. I kind of wanted to do something in, in web or, or something like that. But, but this, this opportunity came up. And all we do is, uh, yeah, we're Petaluma. And, and we work with this microinverter. Uh, I mean, with this Envoy. This is the communications gateway that talks to the microinverter. And what a microinverter is, is this piece of equipment that converts DC energy from a solar panel into AC energy. You know, none of this was taught in, in school to me. Like, none of this was like, oh, here's, this is a microinverter, these are DC voltages, all this stuff. Like, I've learned so much just being in this company about uh, electrical engineering, systems engineering, uh, computer science, and uh, it's cool. Um, I'm surviving. Um, so what this does is it, it talks to the solar panel and this goes into the power line, in, into the breaker of your house. And the breaker is connected to, to these jumper cables and, and to that uh, device. So this, with, with this device, we can, we can talk to the power line and, and receive messages and, and kind of track the energy usage that the microinverters are, are monitoring from, from the roof. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of big data, a lot of parsing, and um, let's see. The, the, the kind of processes I follow in order to, to get the, the software from the development group into the, into the, the actual um, component is, is pretty simple. Uh, I try to do it uh, as, as automated as I can and as frequently as I can. Uh, my job is a build engineer. Anybody heard of that before? Yeah. So it's, I, I'd never heard of it before. Um, it's, it's a job that kind of, I'm, I'm not really developing per se, because I don't know the application completely, but it's a good job to, to start in so that you can, you, you know what uh, the, the whole system is about. Um, because you get, to, you get to build it, which means you get to take the compiled code from the developers, group it up, make sure it's, it's right on the versions that, that the developers need, and then, and then package it and, and test it. Um, so that, that kind of, there's a lot of tools that help me do my job. Um, it's not pretty, it's not that straightforward. Locate and commit a um, So, yeah. 
Uh, these are the, the tools that I use. Um, iTerm is better than, than the terminal application, in my opinion. Um, Vim, uh, I was an Emacs guy here, uh, but uh, VI is, is lightweight, and it fits inside of the, the, the Envoy. And so it's kind of the only editor that we can use on the board to, to program. Uh, so I had to learn that, and I like it. Uh, I use a lot of Make, and, and that was something that, that we, so the Make files that I, that I did in school were, were not that long. Like these Make files here are like thousands of lines long and, and full of macros and uh, expanded variables that, that you have to kind of uh, target uh, different well, yeah, you, you, you package different targets. So with the, with the make application, I can, I can build a target for a specific version of the Envoy because we have different generations of this, of this hardware. So if I want to build a target for a generation uh, that's, that's previous to the one that we're currently working on, then I use make to, to target it and, and to build it. Uh, Git is the, the source code management platform that we use. And uh, that's a must. We, we, you need to know Git. Uh, it's, it's the way that, that all the developers push up the code to the repository so that then I can group the repositories and compile them, test them, and, and release them. Um, and the, the build management tool that I use to compile, test, and release is, is the ThoughtWorks Go. Uh, ThoughtWorks is a company based in San Francisco, and, and they, they created this, this software that allows you to have pipelines. And what a pipeline is, is a representation of the repository. So the representation of the, stat, of the state of the current code that you're working on. Um, and uh, many repositories can, can make up one pipeline. Uh, and so what, what this does is it, it makes it visible for other uh, software developers to to see what you're working on, what what the code is, where the what the status of the code is, if it's failing, if it's good, if it's not, um, and that improves feedback and project management gets off my back. Like I need this today, um, like where where is it? I just point to the application. It's still building. It's not ready yet. Like this is these are the problems that we have, and and so they're happy. Um, this is kind of what it looks like. Uh, the, the first stage is the, the building stage where all the repositories are grouped into, into one and compile, run, like either make or run Ruby or run any, any kind of uh, build script. And then after the build script is done and, and that passes, then it goes through a series of tests, like smoke tests, and those are usually written in, in Ruby. And uh, because it's, it's, it's really easy to, to, to script and it's really easy to, to run too. Um, the, the majority of the code that's on that Envoy is in C and in Lua, and in uh, and we use Ruby to for, for our automation to test the C and the Lua. <laughs> um, what what this pipeline management tool help me helps me do is is go through these uh, these steps pretty quickly. Um, uh, we we also we do automatic testing and automated testing and manual testing. Uh, I'm going to talk about how manual testing is a bad idea. And, but how it's necessary in, in certain cases. And um, yeah, and, and how, how you should really try to always uh, have a continuous integration system, something that keeps building and keeps giving you feedback with your code, if it's good, if it's not good. Um, yeah, so the, the purpose is to, to recreate of every piece of the, the infrastructure used by the application. So, uh, my, the code that we use is, is like 300,000 lines long, and it's really hard to keep track of it. And so uh, there, there are, it's divided into little repositories and sub-chunks. So if, if we can compile them manually, individually, and they work, then the whole application will work. And it's important to, to keep the, the system modular, and, and also to, to keep the, the operating system, the, uh, the configuration, uh, the environment configuration, and um, all, the, all these little uh, files that have certain little numbers that have to be all in accordance with each other in order for it to work. You know, like the configuration of, of a version has to, has to correlate with the, with the version of the application and with the version of the environment that it's, that it's running on. Like, they're just little nuances that don't, 
that, that are not, not as just straightforward as, as, oh, here's the package, and here are all the variables that are, contained, that, that, that are contained inside the package, and this is what could go wrong, this is what could not go wrong. It's not like that. It's kind of like, here's the package, and, and, if it, uh, and, and try it out, you know, test it. If it, if it works, then, then cool. If it doesn't, then where is it broken? Um, uh, and if you have the, the application modular, modularly designed, then it's, it's easier to debug. Um, so my goal is to reduce the cycle time of, of each iteration of each uh, software build. Uh, so if a, a developer commits something that is needed for tomorrow, I need to, I need to get it done. I need to um, integrate it into the code, make sure it works for, for every previous version, for the current version, and make sure that it's, it's tested in every different, uh, every single one of the environments, like every uh, platform, because we have a, the, the new generation and the older generation. So all of that I have to do um, if somebody commits something into the, into the whole uh, repository. Um, and I have to make sure that the software is, that the software that they are committing is the one that is needed for the release. Um, Um, yeah, why is it why is it important to, to make it automated? Because um, that that way, you just commit something and it'll test it for you. All this release, the de deploy and, and debugging and, and testing of, of uh, with Ruby um, helps you look at uh, find bugs faster and and fix them faster. Um, and and it's important to make it frequent because I've. I've had a bunch of uh, releases before that, that they say, okay, I want, I want a 3.11 build. Okay, so I start working on the 3.11 build, and, and then after it's done in packets and everything, and here it is, they tell me, oh no, uh, we needed another version of the device image package, or we need another version of the geolocations or something like that. So you need to produce a whole other build. So what I do is I, I make sure that those changes that are needed by marketing, oh, I, I need this device image package, is inside of the, the package itself. I package it, test it, see if it works, and then send it again. I, I bump the, the, the versions. And this would be simple if, it, if I was in one department, but Enphase has, has many departments, as mechanical engineering, has uh, hardware engineering, firmware engineering, that I need to uh, let them know uh, what the software status is. And, and if I, I keep uh, kind of going back and forth with the, with, with the versions and the bugs that were fixed inside the version, then that, that causes confusion. So what, what I do is I, I make release notes every time that the software build gets created and I share it with the, the rest of the company. And I tell them, uh, this is, these are the bugs that were fixed in 3.11 and these are the bugs that, that were not fixed and these are the stories that we've completed in the scrum <laughs> and these are like, uh, all, all the, the milestones that I've made with this, with this release. Um, and that, that, keeps, that keeps things uh, clear and, and the company kind of happy. No, knowing, uh, because I, I pass the, the release notes to the testing team. And so they need the bugs in order to test them. They need to know which bugs are in to test them. So, so yeah, it has to be clear and, and it has to be precise because if I miss one bug, the, the, you know, it can go out to the field and somebody and uh, some of our customers can find the bug and that's no good. Um, it's important to make it frequent and, and automate it so that if, if there's, and uh, it's important to make it frequent because the, the more frequent you do it, the, the delta of change is smaller. So it's, it's easier to catch the bug. Um, a software application consists of executable code, the configuration, the, date, the host environment, and the data. And all these I need to keep track of and, and need to know what, what um, goes inside of the release package. Um, if any of them change, it can lead to, uh, to, to trigger the, the, the pipeline build process. Um, and all these components should be under version control, like Git or something like that. So everything, everything that, that I make uh, it, at the company, I usually put it under a, a, uh, a Git repository and I push it. 
so that I can share it or, or have it and have the revisions and it's very useful. Um, so about deploying software manually, uh, I have, so this, this Envoy um, has a LCD screen on it and the only way to test the LCD screen is to look at it. And we don't have cameras that are, have object recognition or anything like that. So, so we have a whole team dedicated to, to testing the software manually. Um, it's in, in certain systems, it's crucial to do this. Uh, in others, it's, it's not like web systems and mobile devices. They, they should be more geared towards automating everything. And uh, this, this manual um, checking of, of if, it's, if it's right or wrong, it's, it's very tedious and, and kind of a pain. Um, but yeah, these, these are the kind of things that, that manual testing does. It's, it's what, what can I say about it? Um, it's it's an, it's a necessary bad. It's a necessary evil because you, um, it takes so long for me to debug that thing. Like I need to run a make file, wait until it's done, and then uh, stop the, the the application in there from running, untar the package that I that I just created, and then reset the application that runs the package that I create. You know, all this take takes a lot of time, um, and then test if my change is in there, like if my change actually made whatever bug disappear, uh, that was existing disappear. Um, so, so yeah, embedded system takes a, a, a longer time and uh, to reduce the amount of manual testing is, is key for a happy work environment. <laughs> um, and uh, we, we need to have it automatic because, um, hmm. and, and <laughs> It looks like you guys haven't done much of uh, like automatic code kind of repository aggregation and testing in a repository and then kind of like a pipeline thing. Because in school, I, I just test it myself. Like all of this system is, is one person, right? It's like I check in the code, I test it, I see if it's working, and, and the, the professor gives me a good grade or not if it's, if it's working or not. Um, but here we, we have this uh, the, the, the software tool helps us build and compile and, and make sure that our work is, is correct. Um, so my job really is to pick a version that, that has the, the correct uh, source in it and then press a button to just say deploy. And, and what I, it, it goes from the build stage to the commit stage and from the commit stage to the release stage. Pretty simple. And, and inside those stages, we, we run the, the Ruby scripts that check if the, if the C code is in accordance with what we, with what we were expecting. Um, yeah, this, this kind of software, I mean, I guess I've never been in another company, so I don't know how, how, how manual or how automatic we, we, have, we do things, um, but I think um, it's, it's, it's important for me to have a nice job and, and not to be like up till two in the morning releasing software and checking it and, and see and packaging it and seeing if it's working, this this automation thing has to be has to be like laid out perfectly, and and I think we we have a we have a, a system like that in at end phase, where we can just have a change make uh, commit a change push it and check if the whole system is still working, like in in a few hours. It's not like it's not that quick, but it's it's like forty minutes, an hour or two. Um, yeah, uh, some several problems that I've encountered uh, dealing with a release is that the first the first release is, is usually the, the biggest one, <coughs> the one that has the, the most bugs, the most things to, to fix, um, has the most features, and it's it's hard to get all those features grouped into uh, a document. Because all that's data, and we have to turn it into information so that other parts of the company can understand it. And, and we need to take in all those stories that were completed, the bugs and, and the fixes, and, and put it in the release notes, share it, and hopefully um, the, the, the software verification testing team can, can look at the bugs and, and fix and uh, make, verify them, verify that they are not there anymore. Um, the longer the release cycle, the, the longer it'll take for us to find bugs and for us to 
Yeah, to, to find bugs and to, and to get um, iter iteration cycles going um, to, to target <coughs> milestones. Because I, I work in an, in an agile team, and it's not it's not as uh, as like a web development agile team uh, because we since we have this cross department kind of uh, scenario going. We, we have a hardware schedule, we have a firmware schedule, and we have a software schedule. And the hardware schedule, they, they work kind of in a waterfall uh, where all the requirements are laid out in the beginning and then by a certain date, they all have to be met. Uh, software, it's more like, oh, we go along as, as the, the project is going. Like, uh, I'm working on two stories right now, and, and one I'm ahead on, and the other one I'm not so much, so I'm gonna finish story one by iteration A and, and story two by iteration B. It's not like, like I need to have it all finished by, by, well, I do need to have it all finished by November, you know, but, but the iterations and the way that the, the work is done, it's more, it's more of a cycle thing, not, not of a, like, go through all the checklists and then, and then get it done. It's, it's more like different stories. Um, Another another problem with the release is that uh, sometimes I give out the the piece of software and I give it to SVT, uh, software verification testing, and they don't have their environment set up. They don't have their configuration variables set up. They don't have uh, like even Wi-Fi set up or something. If something goes wrong, that that if I have my my side kind of structured and uniform, I can I can always go back and, and say, hey, did you have this configuration variable? has this number or this version are you using or check your IP address, like all this stuff. Um, so the job of a release manager is kind of the, to maintain and control the, the environment of the, of the package software. Um, I think it's important to integrate testing and deployment and, and, and release activities into the deployment process. Um, we usually don't do a lot of testing in school, kind of well, we do, but, but we don't write code to test the code that we wrote. So um, part, of, part of my job is to write code that tests what I write. And that's, that's a kind of a paradigm or a, some, some way of working, some workflow that some certain developers um, like and some don't. It's test-driven development. Um, in our company, we do we do do that. We do test driven development, and uh, I think it's it's for the better because it, as soon as your application starts getting big and and unit tests start start uh, like using different inherited classes and different libraries, it's it's better to is it just keep it all uniform. Um, what else? We also remember every change that is made to an application configuration or source code environment triggers the creation of a new instance of it. And all aspects of your testing and staging production environment, especially the configuration and third party elements of your system should be applied from version control. Yeah, that's kind of what I wanted you guys to get out of this, that version control is, is kind of the first thing they're gonna ask you, at least in my company, if, if you know how to do it. <coughs> if you can't do Git, you might as well turn around and leave. Or if you can't, uh, Open, like open up a command line and be comfortable with all the like most of the commands, then then get up and leave or something. Like it's not. Um, it, I use the command line every day and and these tools every day, so it's it's it's, it's good to have learned them here. Um, and this is an example of a, of a scrum board. This is what I look at every every day, like at ten o'clock, um, and. These are these are the stories that we're working on, and in here we put the tasks that that we are or that pertain to the story that we are working on, and uh, each each color is uh, each person has a different color, um, and here we just put the task and we keep moving them along, and uh, it's it's just a good way to to let the whole team know what you're working on. And yeah, it's fun. Um, any questions? To like as to I don't know more personal stuff like why I chose M phase or why um, I don't know why I chose M phase. Well, it was it wasn't a choice really. It was well, it was like I, I God 
I'm, I'm here, right? Like, I graduated. I didn't have any place to go. I'm from Puerto Rico. Like, um, and I was just in, like, I didn't have any place to go, basically. So I just started applying for jobs at Indeed.com and Courier Fair and all this stuff. And, and this one came up. Um, I, I did not want to, I don't know, I, I didn't want to go to the city. Um, this was a pretty, pretty small startup company. And I, I didn't know what I was expecting. Um, but I guess, how did I get up here? Um, uh, I, I just could. I, I said that I that I could compile a make file, but it really the make file that I could compile was only ten lines long. But still, if I say that I can compile a make file and run make and it runs, then I got the job. Like that was pretty much the the question they asked me in the interview. Um, yeah, that's how I got through the interview. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, and, and put a, yeah, question. Um, so you graduated from Sonoma State. Yeah. When you graduated, did you feel prepared to go into the no. workforce? No, I still don't. Like, I still go to work, and I'm like, what, what do I have to do again? Like, I need to, um, the, 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 always ask questions. Um, the people there sh should be there to help you. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, but I, I didn't feel prepared at all, and I still don't. Sometimes, like, what did I do today? I don't know, something, something silly, something like Lua, and, and I'm, I'm programming, and I, and, I, and I forgot a comment. Like, how do, how do I write a comment in Lua? I just look it up. It's, it's quick. Uh, or, or ask somebody. Or how do I write a, a variable in Lua? You got to say local, and then the variable name. And then, or, or some kind of, I mean, it doesn't matter if you don't know everything. That's kind of the fun part. That, that you don't know everything, and and the, your, your teammates are supposed to help you uh, get get to where you want to go. Um, so I'd say uh, don't don't worry about about knowing everything. Uh, just just make sure you know what you know well because everybody's going to ask you. Like I I know a lot about like geolocations in my company like geolocations and and TPM profiles, whatever that is right. Um, and so they, they don't ask anybody but me about the, the geolocation and the TBM profiles. So, I mean, and, and it's because I, I kind of wanted to be the, the specialist on that, on that thing. So if, if, you, if you go to the company, you don't know anything, uh, look for something that you like to do and, and try, to, try to be the best at that. And people will, will need you. Yeah. Yeah. Homework, yeah, like as much as I want. So the cool thing about working at Enphase is that it's a startup, and I started as a build engineer, right? What? Yes, I just package the code and, and make sure it's cool, right? And then they're like, okay, I want you to to be a, a software developer now for our embedded team. Um, so I started learning about C and Lua and Ruby and how they all talk together and trying to make applications with that. And and turns out there's this new program coming out of long-term reliability. And there's nobody leading it, so I can I can literally just be there all day trying to create this program, help create this program, so that I have a kind of you know better job or something, or like a promotion, or or I'm looking for for more more opportunities in the software world. So either I can go the the engineering route or the or the management route. I could uh, the engineering route. It's cool because after being a junior, you're you're a principal engineer, and then you're a senior engineer and then you're a staff engineer and then you're a principal engineer so it's there's a lot of steps and and in my group they're all senior engineers i'm the only one that's a junior engineer so to be you know it's i i, I see what the senior engineers do and and i can be working at home uh just like them just just like they're working yeah you don't necessarily always get the credit, you know, like, oh, you just fixed 10 things and you didn't tell anybody about it, but, but you did it, you know. Yes, question. So when you started in, at Enphase, um, I'm not sure what your other interests are, but I'm assuming you're, you're just a software engineer and that's what you studied the most, that's what you right. put the most effort into. Right. And you didn't know anything about their product. Right. Um, right. Are you, grow, or is your interest in 
the things related to their product growing? Yeah, definitely. So like, I didn't know I didn't know what an embedded system was. I kind of just I liked the fact that elevators were embedded systems and like escalators were embedded systems or whatever, and so. Um, I never, and, and I thought toys had embedded systems in them, um, so, so I don't know. I guess the the first three months I was there, I didn't I didn't know that was what it, what I was working on, like because I was just building the code all, all on the on the client itself, um, and then as soon as I figured out that that had an LCD and the LCD was con connected to some header pins and those header pins were going into a microcontroller and that microcontroller is what I was programming, then I was like, oh wait a minute, this is cool, and. Like uh, it's more like the Arduino. I've been like I bring the Arduino to to my work, and I work on projects. And all those engineers there, they 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 love commenting on what I'm doing or or debugging whatever I'm screwing up on, and like telling me, oh, you should put this LED screen like over here instead of here or um, better flow. Um, so, I mean, it was. It was, it was a shot in the dark what I what I just said oh I'm gonna go uh, work for a software company and and luckily I, I got a really cool um, introduction to, to to this world of of, engine, of uh, embedded systems I think I wouldn't go back to web development or like like solely solely a company that's only web based like working here made me realize that that it has to do with the whole system and I like the system system perspective kind of more. Um, yeah. Does that answer your question, kind of? Um, so, yeah, Mark. Yeah. Um, what's the coolest thing about working where you work? Oh, man. <laughs> we get beer all the time. <laughs> we do. Uh, we get like like fun Fridays, and it's where the the company, a CEO tells everybody how we're doing, and we get beer when we're doing well. We've we've been doing well the, the past uh, couple of months, so we've been having beer all the time. Um, we have uh, we have goodies in the lunchroom. We have coffee and Coca Cola on demand, and whatever soft drinks you can think of, and. Uh, and stuff. What else is cool working in there? We have a ping pong table and a foosball table. Um, I mean, it's it's cool working in a place where where I have a ton, like if, if I have a ton of doubts on on my own interests with with my own embedded system ideas and and like creative CS stuff, I can just go there and ask them uh, like, oh, do you guys have some time to, to work on this JavaScript application that I'm I'm working on? Like, take a look at it. And they they they're interested. They want to know, and that's that's kind of hard to to find a place where where they have people who, who not only are there for because they they have to work, but they want to work there. A lot of people just want to work there, and and that's fun. Like going to a place where people are actually um, enjoying the the place they're in. It's it makes a difference. Yeah. Oh. Have you seen the company grow a lot since? Oh man. So uh, I bought stock at like eight bucks and it's at 16. So I guess, yeah, I have. Uh, we had less than 100 employees. No, less than like, we had, we had about 300 employees and now we have more than 300 employees. We have like 300 and like almost 400 employees since I've been there. Um, I've only I've been there for a whole year and it's it's just skyrocketed. This company is going places, um, and I think it's mostly because of the the testing that we do on on our on our systems. Oh, we're looking for manufacturing test engineers and programmers that that can uh, diagnose whatever problem is going on hardware wise or software wise inside of the inside the systems. Um, so we we focus heavily on that and and I think it. It, it makes it makes a difference. You had a question? Uh, yeah, I was wondering if you are thinking about graduate school or if the senior developers on your team are do huh. they have any like um, other education except for their bachelor's degree? Cool question. So I think I don't, uh, Mark. I don't know, but the, the the majority of the of the developers were there. Twelve of them. 
and I think I'm willing to bet only two of them are CS majors or CS related background and the other ones are engineering, uh, electrical engineering. Uh, yeah, and they all code. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I'm actually right now taking a project management certification right here in, in Sonoma State and I'm thinking of a master's, definitely. Definitely a master's. Um, the, the cool thing about working where I work is that uh, it's kind of a meritocracy, so it, it doesn't really matter how much uh, education, well, it does matter how much education you have, but there's this guy who only has a high school degree, and he's a senior level embedded systems engineer. Like, he only has a high school degree, and he can code anything. So, like, I mean, that's, that's kind of the way you have to prove yourself. You, you, you go there and, oh, can you, can you fix this bug? And if you can fix it, you got the job. Like it's pretty much, it's pretty straightforward. <laughs> so you value skill over education, or your company um, puts more emphasis on skill than education. And I, I, we, we balance it a lot. We see, we, we put it on the, on the scale. Um, but if, it, it all comes down to the interview, right? <coughs> if, if, if we show you a problem and the person who, who has the, the education fixes it, then he gets the job. Obviously, like if you have a better education, and I'm no HR person, but I, I would assume that if you have better education and you both solve the problem, then the education person would get hired, like the person who has higher education. But, but I guess that wasn't the case for, for this guy. You've, you've mentioned your interview a number of times, so uh -huh. so give me the look and feel. Are you talking to embedded system engineers, HR? You said you don't, you're not HR department. What right. is that like? Right, so I have, I was interviewed by my my current manager now, was is the software development manager, who wasn't my, my, my manager beforehand, the QA manager for software, um, a software automation test engineer, and and this guy, the high school guy, who's like a make monster. Like he's like a build engineer and he's a overall embedded systems hacker. Um, and they were sitting uh, a round table style, like and and me, and I went with the with a tie, and they said take that off, and <laughs> they, yeah, it, no, that didn't help. So, uh, <laughs> um, and they asked me they asked me a ton of questions. They kind of bombarded me. Like if if one had a good question, then the other one kind of tailed on it, and and wanted to make it more more in depth and. Like, oh, make file, oh, what kind of targets have you built, and how do you call a target, and how do you structure the, the uh, whatever, the, the, the pattern or the code that you're trying to run. Dependencies. It's, yeah, the dependencies. And it, was, it was an interesting, it was like an hour and 15 minutes, the interview. Yeah, it was a long interview. I like to talk a lot. But yeah. Uh, so does that answer the question, kind of? Yeah. Could you go back to the first? Uh, I want to write down your name and. Oh, I don't have my name. I think. Oh, yeah. yeah, but I'll give you my name. Um, Jose Pagan. <laughs> what? P A G A N. Yeah. When you were applying for jobs, about how long did it take you to find this position? Jose was with J, right? Yeah, with the J. Uh, oh my gosh, nothing like three weeks. Three weeks. I mean, what I what I tell people is to to apply for ten jobs a day, because if you don't, then what are you doing? I mean, if you you gotta if you're job hunting, then job hunt. Like look look for ten jobs every day, and if you don't get them, the next day the same thing. Next day same thing. Um, I, I looked like uh, I submitted like two batches and that's it of of, of stuff and I got called for for almost all of them yeah Enphase was was the one that just responded really quickly and gave me an offer right there yeah and software engineer yeah like software build engineer okay. software engineer uh, at what company Enphase I Enphase and I don't think I have that. Yeah, no, you didn't. Uh, phase, yeah. Before I ask you a question, 
I wanted to remind everybody that there is free pizza immediately after this lecture in room 28. Now, a quick question. You've been showing us the gizmo. Can you yeah. tell us what it does? Yeah, so this is, we call this a communications gateway. Well, marketing calls it the communications gateway between the, the, the microinverter and our breaker in the house. So here it tells us the, the, the number of, of watt hours we've, we've consumed in the microinverter. Um, it gives us the, uh, the data that gets collected by this guy on the roof. It just grabs it and, and pulls it and, and puts it into, into these bins. And those bins are then parsed and, and, and analyzed and they are they're piped up to Enlighten, which is our, our uh, server side application. Um, and and that, that data just goes like one side to Enlighten and, and the other one like to here. And this allows uh, the customer to see it right on their, on their house, like their, their power consumption. This is what this Gizmo does. Um, and you can also see it in, in your iPhone or, or, the, or the computer or a PC. Yeah. It, perhaps I have this wrong, but is it, is it correct that Enphase is the only company that puts out 110 on the other side of that inverter? Yeah. Instead, yeah. Of, instead of 600 volt DC? Yeah. So the integration to the grid is much simpler. Yeah. And unlike other systems, correct. you have an inverter on each panel instead of one main inverter. Right. So it's, there's redundancy and, and you get more uh, efficient use of the, of the panel itself. Because shadow on one panel does not cause both voltage drop across all panels. But if, yeah. you have a, if you have an inverter on one <coughs> on each panel. Right, and even shadow on one panel doesn't cause voltage drop, drop on that on panel. panel. Yeah, that's true as well. Other questions? Oh. Okay. Yeah. So you said the data gets uploaded to your to the company's database. Right. Uh, what what um, mechanism? What, what, how is that transmitted? Uh, Three Ethernet. So so the so the customer has to be connected also to the internet. Correct. So this this right here has two USB ports and and uh, we can put a Wi-Fi stick in it and it it's integrated a Zigbee stick or something. And so that it has Ethernet all the time, and it also has that that port right there, that uh, Ethernet port. So yeah, we do have to have an Ethernet connection in order to send the data up to Enlighten to the system database. So, so does it does it? It must store the data locally because if I got one, I live in an area where my internet. I live up on a hill. My internet drops out. Right. Right. Often. So it. It doesn't though. It it saves it. It it saves a certain a certain chunk of data uh, because we do have a database on board, but it's so small that it runs out really quickly of, of space. So, yeah, that that is that is if if there is no internet, then it, it won't report. Like your envoy and your system won't report to the to the system, and it'll report unavailable. Um, and then when it comes back up, then it'll it'll get it. But yeah, the intervals of time in which it was timed out, it won't grab, grab the data. Yeah. Other questions? Sure, Mark, go for it. Sure, um, <laughs> so the little device you have there, how does it run? How do you interact with it? So, we have a serial connection in the back, and we have an Ethernet port right there. Um, so we can either Telnet into it via Moxa, or we can, or we can just um, use, use uh, an SSH, just SSH into it, and uh, yeah. You expect a user to tell into that? No. Yeah. So there is there is a serial port on it, but it, it's it's soldered on. So if you buy it yourself, I mean, you could take it apart and solder it, and then use a Moxa connection to debug it or check what's <laughs> what's inside. You could do that, um, but but I have to do that. Yeah. Um, yeah, those are the two ways of connecting through it. Yeah. When you were um, using the Arduino, did you also have to go to training for that, like learning about all the parts of it? No. So my company, since this is a startup, we don't have a training program like Cisco or, or Oracle does. So the training program is like, here you go, here's this, and turn it on, make, make it work. Google. <laughs> Just Google it, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. Or TFM. 
Uh huh. And yeah, no, no training needed. Uh, if you know, if you know basic I/O, Arduino should be straightforward. Any other questions? Okay. So, uh, pit size is going to be available at one o'clock in Barbie 28. Please stay around for that. Uh, so, if you go there now, which is perfect to get to do, the pizza may not be there. Thank you, Jose, for coming here. And I want to tell you all, the ones who are sitting out here, there's life after college. Yeah, there is. <laughs>